privilege and a pleasure. Um, if you would ask me that last night, I would have said not so much a privilege, not so much a pleasure, but um, one of the things I like about speaking here at Crossroads, and especially in the park view, is I get to see your faces. And this is just a beautiful community. And you see the diversity and the age differences and people with uh, lots of experience walking with Christ and people that have uh, just recently come to Christ. It's beautiful. I wish you could all see it from my view, but it would be kind of awkward. So, um, I get the opportunity to uh, launch our new summer series called While I'm Away. Uh, before we continue, would you pray with me? Uh, Father, we thank you for your presence here today. We thank you that we have the opportunity to gather as a community to talk and share and just reflect on the things of you and your word. Give us your wisdom. Give us your peace. Calm our hearts. Calm my nerves. Um, yeah, Father, take whatever words I say, whatever lyrics we've sung together, <laughs> take those and mold them and transform them into something that's beautiful, full of your power, full of your intent, full of your grace. We thank you, and we know that you can do that, and we pray that in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, summer is the season of travel, isn't it? We already see some of the diaspora happening. Families packing up, going on trips together. For parents, this often involves a lot of organization and concentrated activities, uh, but there comes a season in life, eventually, where the kids get into their late teens and the parents consider, maybe even are tempted, to go on vacation by themselves and leave their kids at home. <laughs> For you parents that have young children, I can already see the twinkle in your eye. So it's not the point of the sermon today, but just feel free to enjoy that moment. I'm not sure if you can relate to this scenario whether from your own childhood experience or maybe uh, as a parent who's had to um, make that step of leaving, leaving their child alone without a babysitter for the first time, or maybe alone for the weekend all by themselves. It could be a big deal. A typical response of a parent in situations like this would be to make lists and reminders with emergency contact info, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They might be left in the form of post-it notes left on the refrigerator, or instructions left on the washing machine, or a series of hastily written text messages composed on the way to the airport. Notes to help their children consider and prepare for things that they might not have encountered before. Remind them of some of the basics for living alone, some encouragement for, things, for when things get rough or uncertain, even if they get lonely. Basically to keep them safe and out of trouble until the parents return. In a similar way, the New Testament authors wrote letters full of instruction and encouragement with helpful hints and even household warnings to the churches and communi communities from which they were separated. And even though the authors of these letters and churches were from various backgrounds and cultures, nationalities, religious uh, bents, and even native languages, the themes from these letters keep recurring over and over again. And it's regardless of whether it's Paul writing to the Greek believers in Thessalonica, or if Peter's addressing Jewish believers dispersed across Asia Minor in modern Turkey. The number of times these topics reoccur and the consistency of the messaging it's striking in the presence of that diversity. And it suggests that maybe there's something to this that maybe is relevant for us today and not just for the original audience. And I think particularly for our community with the diversity that we have, um, brothers and sisters from around the world, newbies to Christ, old timers with Christ, we all come here and we're all in need of those messages, those reminders, that instruction. 
And so this summer, we're going to be looking at the following notes from some spiritual parents, like Peter, Paul, John, Jude, and others. While I'm away, pay attention. While I'm away, remember who you are and make wise choices. While I'm away, stay in touch. Call if you need anything. While I'm away, if you think you get stuck, read the manual. While I'm away, get along with each other. While I'm away, don't worry, I won't be gone long. And while I'm away, be kind to the neighbors. Each one of these topics addressing a recurring theme found in the New Testament books throughout, uh, yeah, throughout the New Testament. And so today we start, while I'm away, pay attention. And I've always wanted to say that at the beginning of a message. Just pay attention. (laughs) It turns out the New Testament letters are full of phrases like, be self-controlled and sober-minded. Be on your guard. With minds that are alert and fully sober. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Why? Why? What is it that we're supposed to be paying attention to? Well, if we look at the context of those phrases, we find something like, pay attention to what is really going on around you. Or what my friend Stuart King used to describe as the reality of the situation. By paying attention to and understanding the reality of the situation, we gain perspective, spiritual perspective. In the military world, they call this situational awareness, and it's the basis on which military decisions are made. I was a bit hesitant to use a military reference for a spiritual theme, but Paul started it, so I think I'm okay. If you remember in Ephesians, he says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms in Ephesians 6. He then goes on to describe the equipment that God has provided to counter this. The full armor of God. Many of you are familiar with this passage, but it talks about the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. If he was really in the military, he would have had an acronym for that, but the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. So right there, we have the situational awareness. That's the reality of the situation. That's the real context in which we live. Spiritual beings living in a physical world, navigating both what we see in the spirit, in the physical, as well as what we don't in the spiritual. And although the real battle is in the spiritual domain, Our senses are constantly being bombarded with things we see and hear and feel in the physical world. Our minds are constantly being distracted away from spiritual things, aren't they? I'd like to blame social media. I'd like to blame the internet. But this problem has been going on for thousands of years. It's a human thing. It's not a tech thing. The highs and lows of everyday life consume us And not only the challenges and the suffering and the pain that we feel, but also the good things in life, the career advancements, educational achievements, material possessions. They're all equally capable of not only distorting our view of what life is really all about, but can prevent us from having any spare capacity to reflect upon our spiritual condition. They're all consuming. And to me, the closest thing that I can uh, make an analogy to is a video game. Now, I have to admit, I am a fan of Nintendo Switch, and on occasion, I've been known to get sucked into a game, like really sucked into a game. In those moments, we can talk about which games later for some of you that are interested. But in those moments when I'm engrossed in the game, it doesn't matter that I know it's a game. It doesn't matter if I'm winning or even if I'm losing. I need to take a step back. I need a reminder to step back, get some perspective, 
look at the reality of the situation, and then, then I should probably go to bed. But I think we can all be like that a little bit regarding the way we live our lives, can't we? We get so easily sucked in and distracted by the things of this world that we lose our focus and forget that the stuff going on in the spiritual realm is really what it's all about. That's the real stuff of life. So we need the reminder, we need the encouragement to pay attention, to be alert to what's really going on. You know, this was not an abstract theological topic or philosophical point that these authors were trying to make. They believed that it was critical for the followers of Christ to fully understand and grasp this. And that's why they emphasize it over and over again in the New Testament letters. Looking at the various verses where, they, where we're called to pay attention, we can see that there is at least three areas that the authors found important. First is protection. They were concerned that we'd be protected from Satan, just like we read about in Ephesians. Protection against false teachers, and even protection from ourselves and our natural inclination to go back to the old ways of sin and unhealthy living. The second area that we see come back in, uh, time and time again is to pay attention for encouragement. Knowing and paying attention to the promises of God and the provisions, the things that he's already generously, generously given to us it is so important. It not only encourages us in time of suffering, but it also keeps us from being tossed about or distracted by every new thing that comes along offering some new insight or experience. The final area where paying attention is critical is spiritual maturity and growth. And I'd like to unpack that a little bit more by using Peter's own words from his second letter. And as I read, I, I hope you feel the sense of Peter's love for this group, of his feelings of responsibility for their spiritual war, uh, welfare, and the depth of his passion for the deeper things of Christ. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 1 of Second Peter. From Simeon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have been granted a faith just as precious as ours. May grace and peace be lavished on you as you grow in the rich knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And I can pray this because his divine power has bestowed on us everything necessary for life and godliness through the rich knowledge of the one who called us by his own glory and excellence. Through these things he has bestowed on us his precious and most magnificent promises so that by means of what was promised, you may become partakers of the divine nature. After escaping the worldly corruption that is produced by evil desire. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith excellence and to excellence knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness, brotherly affection, to brotherly affection, unselfish love. For if these things are really yours, if these things are really yours and are continually increasing, they will keep you from becoming ineffective and unproductive in what? In your pursuit of knowing our Lord Jesus Christ more intimately. I love this passage. I was telling Miriam yesterday how I'm a little bit embarrassed that it takes me a while to get to Second Peter because usually Ephesians and Galatians are really well written, so you just kind of stop with that stuff. But First and Second Peter, First and Second, Third John are worth a, a, a visit, if you will. But I, I love this because it's packed with such meaty stuff. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Because of God's promises, 
you and I are able to partake in the divine nature. We should make every effort, we should turn our attention to seeing our faith develop with the goal of knowing our Lord Jesus Christ more intimately. And I love the fact that this passage so clearly encapsulates the idea of spiritual maturity. It's not about the number of people that you've helped bring to Christ. That's okay. That's a good thing. But it's, and it's not the extent of your biblical knowledge. And that's okay. That's a good thing. It's not about your leadership potential. That's okay sometimes. <laughs> no, the goal of spiritual maturity is knowing Christ more intimately. It sounds so simple. And at first I thought that that's both beautiful and a bit convicting at the same time. I don't know about you, but my relationship with Christ, I don't often think about in that way, about knowing him more intimately. One of the disadvantages of growing up in the church, of having been a Christian for a long, long time, is that we can sometimes be lulled into a false sense that we understand God. We have them pretty well figured out. Of course, intellectually in our minds, we know that that's not true, that's not possible, but sometimes our actions indicate that we kind of think we do. Oh, God will do that. God can't do that. One of the worst things we can do, folks, and I am kind of preaching to myself here, so just feel free to join me. Uh, it, one of the first things we can do is to assume that we know what God is going to do or how he's going to do it. When we do that, we limit God in our minds and we've limited ourselves and his ability to use us. So if you're agreeable, I would propose that we adopt a posture individually and as a community, a posture of being ready to let God surprise us. Let's see if we can get to the point with each event, with each encounter we have in our everyday lives, we get to the point where it's automatic, knee-jerk response becomes, God, what are you going to do here? If you want me to be a part of it, let me know. If not, can I watch? To be excited about what God is doing actively in this world, to be curious about what it is, who he is. Let's remind each other to pay attention enough to ask those questions. Let's remind each other to pay attention to hear the response. Now, by the time Peter wrote his second letter, he knew that he didn't have much time left on earth and therefore not much time to help shepherd and guide the community that he loved so much. But he committed himself to keep reminding them of the essentials to protect them to encourage them, to help them grow right up to the very end of his life. And we can be sure that he frequently reminded them of their Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ and the sacrifice on the cross and what that meant and the reality of the situation, the implications of it all. I'm going to read from Peter's first letter and then I'll ask Miriam to come up and lead us in communion. From 1 Peter 2, 22 to 25. He committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. When he was maligned, he did not answer back. When he suffered, he threatened no retaliation, but committed himself to God who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we may cease from sinning and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you were healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have turned back to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. <clears throat>